Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode five of Smoke and Spirits. My name is Dominic, and I will be your host this evening, as I have been for the past four episodes. I knew I was sort of saying something dumb as I was saying it, but it was too late to stop. It's probably because I'm so excited about uh, the guests that I've uh, chosen to have tonight. And by guest, I mean this bottle right here next to me. The name of Lefroig is undoubtedly known to many of you if you are enthusiasts of the Eyeless Single Malts. And I wanna say that when somebody sort of thinks about the most intense aspects of an Eyeless Single Malt Scotch, they, they may be thinking of Lefroig. In fact, I've been to many gatherings in the past and I've had many discussions with fellow uh, whiskey enthusiasts. And when the topic comes around to really smoky, really intense, really peaty, full of iodine and, uh, and brine, the name Lefroig inevitably comes up. And it's almost kind of like a running joke in certain uh, Scotch circles where, you know, only a certain type of person will drink Lefroig. And certainly I think that one of the, the truest things that you can say about Lefroig is that you either love it or you hate it. So a lot of people make that face when you even mention the name Lefroig. And they'll sort of say, oh, that's disgusting. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just the worst thing ever. Which is shocking to someone like me or others of you out there who really like Lefroig because to you, it's the best thing in the world. Certainly, I would put the Lefroy Quarter Cask as one of my top three favorite whiskeys. It's very intensely flavored, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment. Let's talk about the distillery itself. So Lefroy is uh, not a newcomer to the, uh, the business in the world of Scotch whiskey. The distillery itself was actually founded in 1815. And as we look at our map here, you'll see that it's in that same neighborhood as Ardbeg and Lagavulin. It's just down the road from them. And in fact, as I've said before in previous episodes, I've not traveled to Island myself, but I've done a lot of reading on it, certainly on my bucket list to travel there. And in the reading that I've done, it, you can actually walk from the one distillery to the other to the other. The name Lefroig means broad, hollow, by the bay. And one of the coolest things about Lefroig, one of the neatest things that I think, is if you examine the bottle closely, you'll see a little crest on it right up here. And that is the crest of His Royal Highness Prince Charles, who is the present day Lord of the Isles, is one of his titles. As you know, the royals have many titles ascribed to them, and this is one of them. So His Royal Highness Prince Charles is the present day Lord of the Isles. And it, it sounds very really majestic, and it makes you think of all those sort of high fantasy movies and TV shows. Um, and in 1994, uh, Prince Charles actually gave his royal warrant to the distillery of Lefroig. So the Lefroig distillery is producing Scotch whiskey by appointment uh, from His Royal Highness, the, uh, the Prince of Wales. In fact, the story has it that when he visited the distillery, uh, he made a comment to the distillery manager at the time that he hopes that they always continue to produce whiskey in the way that they, they do because in his opinion, in his royal opinion, uh, it's the finest whiskey in the world. In this instance, I certainly agree with Prince Charles. It's my favorite whiskey. Like I said, it's in my top three, but it's, it's probably my, my top one. We'll talk about my other two um, in future episodes. So Lefroy certainly has other expressions in its core line. Um, and if some of you have looked into this in the past, you'll be familiar with the Lefroy Cardeus, the Lefroy Lore, the Lefroy Tenure, the Lefroy Select, the Lefroy Triple Wood. They have a number of them. They've certainly not been idle over the years. They're immensely um, productive in terms of their offerings. I keep coming back to this one and it's kind of a bittersweet thing for me because I have tremendous respect for the Lefroy line and the Lefroy craft, but this is, this is kind of the only one that I really absolutely love from them. So much so that actually, this is really funny, when you buy a bottle of the Lefroy quarter cask, you'll get um, a little little pamphlet in the, the cylinder and it's the 
Passport to Isla. So if you take these small pamphlets and you go online to the Lafroy website, you can register the number that is to be found inside here. Okay, so there's a number inside here. You can go register that on the website and apparently it gives you a claim to one square foot of the the land owned by the, uh, the Lafroy distillery. And the reason this amuses me so much is because if I actually did that, and I haven't, because I, every time I try to do that, I run into some tech issues on the Lafroy website. So if anybody from Lafroy is listening, can we please get that resolved? Because at this point, I bought so many of these bottles that I could probably build my own little cottage right next to your distillery, and I'd be the happiest man in the world. Okay, but uh, so that's what that's what these are there, and that's kind of what I meant to imply by that is that I've bought so many of these bottles of quarter cask. So in the past episodes, we've talked about the capacity of different barrels that will hold spirits during their maturation process, sometimes during their finishing process, which is something that typically occurs after the maturation. So the difference between maturation and finishing is that when a spirit is left to mature in a cask, that will be the lion's share of the time it's spending in the cask. A distillery may choose to then transfer that spirit to another cask so that it can imbibe the characteristics of that wood. So you may be talking about like a first fill oak cask, you may be talking about an ex-bourbon cask as sort of your your uh, maturation cask, but it's not uncommon for distilleries to then move their spirits to um, sherry casks or even wine casks if they want to make things interesting. So the cool thing about the Lefroy quarter cask is that the quarter cask is significantly smaller than the other barrels that may be used to mature the spirit. And what that means is that there's way more contact being made between the liquid and the surface area of the inside of the barrel. So the liquid itself is much more intensely flavored. It takes in uh, way more of the, uh, the flavors and the aromas that are imparted on it by the cask and by the wood itself in a shorter period of time. Because the Freud Quarter Cask is not uh, tremendously um, ancient whiskey. It's only aged for a few years, okay? So this is kind of the uh, the reason why I think they get such a tremendous result in a relatively short period of time is by putting it in uh, in that quarter cask. So as we uh, as we examine our bottle here, we've got something that is uh, packs a fair amount of punch. It's a 48% alcohol by volume. I'm gonna crack that open. All right, so you can, you can sort of smell it from here, actually. And it's not indicative of its, uh, of its alcohol by volume, but rather it's more indicative of how richly flavored it is. So you'll know by now that I do like to add a drop of water to my dram. And this spirit is actually it's got some fairly strong legs, and just as a quick reminder for those of you that are watching this episode first, the legs is the, uh, the sticky residue that's left around the inside of the glass. So when you say it's got strong legs, you can also say that uh, it has a, a fairly robust body to it. This spirit that I'm looking at is a deep burnished gold. It's almost a little bit ruddy. Um, so certainly looks like uh, almost like a deep oak color. So what I really appreciate about the Lefroy quarter cask is it is complex. Um, it is intense and it's multifaceted, much in the way that your favorite whiskey is, probably, and the way that most uh, well-crafted whiskeys are. This one 
is surprising and it's amusing for me to think of comparing Lefroy Quarter Cast to the other Scotch whiskeys that I've already done on my show, where we typically, I mean, this is, this is the whole point of using this Copita glass and tilting it on its side is that we can start sort of up here and make our way through the different strata of nosing notes. So you'll get the more delicate ones at the top. And what I notice with the Lefroy Quarter Cask is that it's, it's very delicate. It's actually hard to pick stuff up here at the top. Okay, and actually what I'm getting is mostly brine, it's mostly sea air. It's got faint hints of vanilla and caramel, but they're very faint. It's certainly not one of the, uh, the major players here. Okay, and as you make your way through the top note, like I said, which is a sort of like a, like a thick sea brine, like a thick sea air on, on a stormy day, you're making your way down through there. It's got very comfortable, comforting notes of uh, vanilla and a little bit of uh, caramel, but also like that charred, the inside of the cask, which is charred, is actually what's responsible for those caramel notes more often than not. And I think I've mentioned that in previous episodes. And you can get a hint of that. It's not like your typical candy caramel. This is definitely the sort of caramel that you would get from the charring of the inside of a, of a cask, for sure. But that comfortable sort of homey caramel uh, vanilla uh, transitions into some fairly pronounced iodine notes. Not too much smoke. The smoke is actually fairly light. And this is where it bottoms out. So it bottoms out with those iodine notes um, with the peat. There is peat there, but it's actually not super overwhelming. You're going to change your mind about that in a second when we sort of get into the tasting. And if you haven't yet tried the Lefroy Quarter Cask and you do like the Isle of Single Malts, I wholeheartedly encourage you to go pick a bottle of this stuff up. It should be fairly um, available at most of uh, your local shops where you, uh, where you buy your scotch. So we've got the iodine definitely uh, pronounced, and then you got the peat and a little bit of smoke, and that's sort of where it it, uh, it stops for me. But as we know, the story doesn't end there. We're gonna get right into this glass. Now, in a stunning power play, on the palette, the peat is the major player there. It's the, the power player, comes through a very strong, very powerful, bringing its uh, erstwhile companions of the smoke and the peat. Iodine takes a bit of a back seat there, okay. But as it opens, the mouthfeel is, uh, it's off dry. It, it's not dry at all. Uh, it is, it's pleasant. It's not especially viscous. There is a bit of a tingle there, but as I've explained before, this is sort of where the ethanol will sort of zap the inside of your mouth. And it's probably one of the strongest cases I can make for adding some of the water to your dram. Because if you're dealing with something that's 48% the way that this one is, um, we were talking about other expressions that were in the 50s, then you're gonna want to experience everything that it has to offer. And if the ethanol is too strong there, if it hits you right in the palate as soon as you start getting into your dram, you won't be getting as much as you could be from the tasting notes.
Yeah, so off dry mouthfeel on the palate. We've got the peat, uh, loud and proud. It's followed up with a whiff of smoke. It's got that iodine base that we had already nosed when before we got into the glass. The, uh, the finish is on the bitter side. So the iodine will linger. It's got quite a long finish and the iodine is sort of the thing that stays with you. The peat, not so much. I mean, at this point, I think in the later stages of our tasting experience, you've still got the iodine, which was our kind of our base throughout most of this stuff from the nosing uh, to the tasting to the finish. It's been there. It just sort of is varied in terms of how powerfully it comes through. The peat has started to fade away on the finish. I'm left with some smoke and with some iodine and with that salty tang that you could associate with seaweed or with the salt breeze that we opened with. Okay, yep, so the sea salt comes through actually a little bit more prominently than I first gave it credit for. Right there on the palate. And actually, as I think about it, one of the topics that frequently comes up in discussion with friends of mine that uh, that like the scotch whiskey is precisely that. Most of the flavors that you'll associate with the Isla Single Malts seem to me to be amplified at least tenfold in the Laphroaig Quarter Cask. And as I mentioned, you've got a shorter amount of time, but a greater contact with the inside of the cask. And then you're left with something that ramps that peat up and it ramps up the smoke and it ramps up the iodine and all of that stuff. So it is very intense and it is very richly flavored. In fact, they lay claim to be the most richly flavored Isla Scotch whiskey out there, a claim that I would be hard pressed to dispute. That being said, I haven't tasted all of the Scotch whiskeys out there, but it's on my bucket list, the same way that visiting Isla would be. But one thing I can say with 100% certainty is that the Lefroy Quarter Cask is absolutely my go-to. It's the one that I keep coming back to. It's kind of like my home base. Whether or not I try other scotches or I experiment a little bit or I sort of try to branch out, this is the one that has a constant place of honor in my liquor cabinet and I keep coming back to it. One of my favorite things to do actually is I tend to indulge in this one more in the colder months, so in the fall or the winter, it's absolutely the perfect time to enjoy the Laphroaig Quarter Cask because it is so rich and it's dark and it's uh, peaty and smoky. Uh, I, to me, that is the perfect thing to enjoy on a cold fall day or a cold winter's day for sure. As is often the case with your dram, as you work your way through it, you'll start to see other flavors coming up. So don't be afraid to sort of take that moment to pause, keep an open mind, which is something I do keep repeating here on this channel and with my episodes. Keeping an open mind is probably the most important thing you can do when you're sampling a new scotch, or even if you're coming back to an old friend, the way that I do with the Lefroy Quarter Cast. There's always something else to be found. Again, we did talk about how complex the art of distilling Scotch whiskey is, um, and not just the, the distillation, I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying it. There's way more to it than that. In fact, I'm quite excited to talk to you about um, another Scotch in future episodes that takes the concept of farm to bottle quite literally and quite seriously. But for now, I'm gonna stick with the Lefroy quarter cask. And my advice to you, as always, is to keep an open mind, whether it's your first time trying a Scotch or your hundredth time, trying a scotch. There's always something there, so stretch out your senses, try to pull the most you can from your dram um, using the olfactory senses in your nosing, um, in the tasting, and the mouthfeel, and the finish of your scotch. Um, and as you're sort of going about your daily life, you often will be faced with 
uh, scents and aromas and these are things that are subconsciously being stored away in uh, in your memory banks and these are things that may come to mind when you taste your scotch so it's kind of neat to be able to put a name to the tasting note that you're experiencing like oh yeah this sort of uh, tastes a little bit like that beach bonfire that I was at last year or something like that but the point I wanted to make with this is that you can see I've sort of made my way through the dram a little bit and as you do um, you will pick up different flavor notes and that's partly because at this point the inside of my mouth has been coated with this liquid my taste buds have sort of grown accustomed to it to some extent and I did add a little bit of water there so I think it's a little bit easier to sort of pick up in my mind on what I call those those level two tasting notes we've sort of been acquainted with the most powerful nosing and tasting notes right off the bat but now we're sort of digging a little bit deeper and we're sort of finding those things that may have been a little bit too subtle to have been noticed the first time around so that's sort of what I want to leave you with here is scotch tasting is not something I'm an expert at it's something that I'm constantly working on and certainly there's many experts out there who could probably talk at length about stuff that I've missed or neglected to mention in this stuff but the guiding rule and the rule of thumb I keep coming back to is to keep an open mind and take your time with it and really sort of try to stretch out and make those associations in your mind. I talked in previous episodes about how certain smells and certain tastes may trigger certain memories or may uh, cause you to think about certain things. Science has shown that scent is one of the most uh, powerful things that's associated with memory for human beings and this is why you can sort of smell something years later and it will bring back a memory from 10, 20 years ago or something like that. So it's a very powerful thing. Um, so that's sort of my advice to you right now. Again, not being an expert and I fully understand that what works for you is going to be what works for you. So I'm certainly not telling you to abandon your uh, past practices. I'm merely suggesting something that uh, has worked for me and has led to uh, many quiet moments spent enjoying the various multifaceted, incredibly complex drams uh, that I have experienced in the past. And I hope to share them with you on future episodes of the show. Um, but final bottom line for anybody who's watching this, if you want something that's dark and intense and peaty and the pen ultimate embodiment of a wild and savage Isla Single Malt Scotch, do pick up the Laphroaig Quarter Cask and you will not be disappointed. Take it with a drop of water and uh, use a Glencairn glass or a Copita glass like this and set some time aside to, to become acquainted with this. Until next time, stay thirsty.